Welcome back to Friday Night League. We are gearing up for our official game one between Immortals and Dignitas. But before we do, as we approach the midpoint of the season, it's typical for us to get a tally on the all pro team. But I'm making one important caveat. You are not allowed to pick a member from the spring first all pro team, AKA Cloud9. And while you're all tasked to do this individually, separately, interestingly enough, most of the roster is the same across all of you. I think they just copied my homework. I think that's pretty much it. Um, for top lane, I think it was a pretty easy one. Uh, outside of Licorice right now, uh, Solo's been performing the best. We're not in a top lane carry meta where we see these top laners pop off. So really what I was looking for, and I guess you know, Crumbs and Mark were probably looking for the same thing, is a stable top laner who has a strong laning phase, strong team fights, and that's what Solo has. He really unlocked FlyQuest's early game. They actually were starting to dive top with him in the roster, and he's had a monster performance this split. And I think, yeah, right now, no one's really contesting him for that second spot. Yeah. Uh, we all had the same four members except for the AD carry, which is why it's uh, kind of blacked out there, and we'll, we'll all reveal our own, uh, I think, at the end. But, but yeah, for top laners, Kumo was the one that I was looking at maybe because he does have a lot of the second-best laning stats behind Licorice. But uh, I think, you know, based off the metrics that probably was talking about, we all kind of felt the same way, and especially with the eyeball test we, we all went with solo i think we all felt the same way about santorin as well oh, i yeah. mean it's yeah. pretty clear blabber is the best jungler in the lcs it's kind of unfair that we're, we can't pick from c9 because that would have been really easy but there's nobody else that's really giving you the consistency that Centaurin has right now. His Trundle is probably the best one, probably better than Blabber's. I'd say, yeah, definitely he's got the best Trundle in the league. And then he's able to play carry-style junglers as well and still be really efficient. So I think that Centaurin has just been one of the better junglers in the LCS. And maybe if the rest of the team can play to the level that maybe Cloud9 is playing, we get to see just how far Centaurin can go. It, it's funny you talk about how you know clear cut second place for jungler was. I didn't feel like it was that at all for for mid lane, and somehow we all landed on Bjergsen, which was crazy to me because I thought someone would have picked Poe. I thought someone might lean towards Suzuki or Jensen or one of these other people, but somehow we all ended up on Bjerg. Um, and I, for me, I think he's been really, really important in all of TSM's wins. He is often also trying new things like the Fiddlesticks mid. He's roaming a lot on those champions or the TF. And I think uh, his stats won't look great for those reasons, but he has been instrumental in the, the victories. So I think the one thing that really shied me away from PoE and more towards Bjergsen is that PoE has not played a single game of Twisted Fate. I think that's a pick that you have to be able to bust out right now in the current meta. If you're not getting those banned against you, you could really just be drawing a ban and get your free a free ban for your team. There hasn't been any Galio either as well. So there's not a lot of global pressure, I think, from, from this mid lane, which is why I think that that's something that I highly value right now, or at least being able to show it. He hasn't done so, and for me, Bjergsen takes it because of that. Yeah, I mean, I think a big reason why we all chose Bjergsen was his last week's performance, getting, like, player of the week as well. Like, his TF was a monster, his Azir was a monster. I will say, earlier in the split, it wasn't so hot. But considering last week, it, if you chose anyone else after watching his performance last week, it'd be uh, a little disingenuous. And perhaps making plays in multiple lanes within a single minute's time keeps Bjergsen at the forefront of all of your minds. But when it came to the bot lane position, y'all all differentiated yourselves from one another. And I would like to call it to the audience, though, that when it came to each of our analysts guessing what the other analysts slotted into the bot lane position, everyone guessed correctly. So I'm kind of half convinced that personalities came into play more than stats in some cases. But Crumbs, why don't you start us off? I think on the personality turn, I think it's that we know what each one of us likes in a player. And so we're like, oh, I know what kind of stuff you like about about for your marksman right here. And so for me, I was thinking, okay, if this is the second all pro team, they might have to play at some point. I want a clutch player down in the bottom lane. And if I'm pairing them up with Core JJ, who else than the bot laner that they've won four championships with already? So I went with double lift because yes, he has had some very tactical ints. But he also has the most kills for the AD role. So I think that he actually is what I want from this role. I want somebody that will be able to always deliver when it comes to these clutch moments. That's what he can be. He can be clutch. Now, yes, 
He's not in form. This is not the double lift that has won all these championships before. He's still recovering from last split's TL blunder. But when you look at the rest of the pool, come on. The other guys really don't hold a candle to, to him. What are you, are you talking about? It's not in form yet. That's the whole point. Is It's it's through the first half of the split. Yeah. Who's been performing the best? I don't care if hypothetical worlds from now I would want double lift too. You're probably right. I probably would too. But for right now... Through, through the first four weeks, I can't go with Doublelift. I think Tactical was better. He slammed him in lane. He's been really... That was the first game. That was the first game. That was a, yeah, that was one of eight games they've played so far. <laughs> <laughs> it is not the biggest sample size. And he's been a, a, a very impressive player uh, so far in, in this split. He's... He's second uh, in kills and assists at 15 of all bot laners. He has had uh, really impressive performances, and he's also been able to experiment a little bit and bring a level that, while he was there, Doublelift hadn't done on Team Liquid, busting out the Casio uh, and working well with Core JJ and all the weird picks that he has. Before I unleash my pick, I do want to mention Mark is correct about Doublelift. He's not in form like you said, Crumb, so... He's he's not in contention. We but agree. Mark, not you not also... in contention. <laughs> whoa, no. whoa. No, no, not for oh the top. Word. Not for second spot. And you also said, Mark, we're not talking about potential. So I don't know why Tactical's up there yet because he's not there yet. He has a potential to be great, but not right now. I would say Core JJ smashed double in lane and not Tactical. So I think it's not about dominating lane. I think it's about team fights, and that's why Bang is my second All Pro. AD carry. I think he's probably one of the best uh, team fight AD carries we have. I think his lane stats are great as well, and especially on EG where they have a really volatile playstyle. When the game does slow down, this guy pops off like crazy. And you see the all pro team. We got Bjergsen. We got Solo, I don't know. We got Santorin. This is gonna be a slow game where he okay. can actually excel. I'm looking at his last uh, at his match history. He's got four games now. Some of them are losses. Some are wins. Zero kills on four games. Uh, that, that doesn't strike me as a second all-pro player. player. That doesn't strike me as an all-pro player, probably. And Hey, sometimes in their losses, he doesn't know where to go because we don't know what we're watching when we're observing the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fair. And all of y'all ended up selecting Core JJ. Only one of those players is currently playing with him in the bot lane, though. Who knows how that would end up factoring in. None of them whatsoever are in our first game of the day, though, which is between Immortals and Dignitas. And Immortals truly did have two of the closest games that we have seen in history. And that ain't just a hyperbole, folks. This comes down to statistics. Yeah, uh, in week four, in the two games that Immortals lost, it was a 98.5% close percent, which is the highest in a single week we have ever seen. This is, you know, how close the gold is together. Uh, it, it was super insane. They even had a 100% game uh, where it was close the entire time, even though they lost, which is, is hard to believe. And despite that... When they did lose and kind of blunder away these close games, it was not horrible macro or anything like that that we've seen out of, like, say, the CLG game or the Dig and Toss game. It was individual mistakes that were very small mechanical misplays by Insanity. Here, oh. if he gets the ball on top of the Malphite, this is game over, and they're beating Team Liquid, you know? And it was the same story with the EG game where it was a, a bit of a mis-execution, maybe a little bit of a, a going for a play that wasn't going to work out. So. It's it's hard to say that they're actually playing back. These are two playoff-bound teams, probably, in EG and Team Liquid that they barely lost to. Yeah, and I got to say, these kind of plays, although they end up, you know, spoiler alert, they end up going wrong for Immortals, um, being led by Insanity in a lot of these calls was pretty impressive, um, mostly because coming off of a loss they had against TL, where he was the reason, you know, he didn't get the Orianna ball on top of the Malphite, and then to still make aggressive plays in the next match, like, that bodes very well. Like, I'm very excited to see this player, especially in his first week at LCS, making two, you know, almost game-deciding plays. This is a Dark Horse team. This is the one with the the roster that feels like they, they can definitely challenge these top teams. That's what they have here. But with the re track record that they have, people are likely to underestimate them. Yeah, and Crumb... Yeah. Oh, or go oh, ahead, go Probably. Ahead. I was going to say, like, yeah, Insanity's lead is not just, like, these two plays we're talking about that, like, kind of flubbed a bit. Insanity's been a great laner as well. Both of these players uh, on Immortals are four games each, so this is not, like, a, you know, one-game sample size and we're cheating. He has a 5.6 KDA compared to Aika's, or Aika's one. And if you notice, like, his damage percentage is pretty healthy, kill participation, uh, the damage mid-difference is also a positive note. So his laning stats are good. He, he's making big plays. Like, these are the kind of things you want to see in a mid laner. And to be fair, this is not blown out by, you know, 
having more wins. He's one in three. So it's not like he's getting inflated KDA the way that you sometimes see when, you know, you get a new player on a good team and it's like, hey, we're all winning. My KDA is great. Like he's still in these struggles, but putting up much better numbers. When it comes to player performance, even in the losses, you have to think about were those mistakes something they can learn from or not? And it's a great thing to see those minor mechanical moments. Crumbs is somebody that has seen the two academy players on the side of IMT now making their debuts in the LCS. Do you have any insight on tracking how their performances have compared regularly within the academy league compared to here on this stage? Uh, they're definitely getting a lot better, actually. The teams that are coming down from LCS into academy are really trying to get back onto the main stage so believe it or not even yesterday I had some really impressive gameplay so you, you got to go down and check it out because these guys don't want to stay down there for long so that competition is only going to put a fire under the new LCS team's butt and so they're both going to try to compete to just see who the top dog is at the end of the year. There's plenty to fight for here on the virtual LCS stage. But for everyone watching at home, a friendly reminder that drops are currently enabled here for the LCS. Now, that means when in-game events play out, you'll get rewards and collectibles. All you have to do is go to watch.lolesports.com with your League of Legends account and opt into receiving rewards. When a drop is triggered, you'll get an on-screen notification and you'll receive the rewards in client. You've got a chance at Hextech chests, clash tickets, and even more beyond that. So make sure you sign up now as we add more triggers down the line. For more info, check that out on lolesports.com. For now, we are going to see which team can pick up a win in game number one. So let's send things over to Captain Flowers and Azale for game one. Thank you very much, Latigris. I have traded in Colby's arcane knowledge of ages gone by <laughs> for the knowledge of a literal world champion here with Mr. Isaac Azale Cummings Bentley. And we are about to jump into this battle at the bottom of the standings. We've got Immortals. We got Dignitas. I think they both got to be chomping at the bit to get a win here. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, Dignitas especially, they still are winless, man. So Dignitas really wants to get on the board. Uh, it's embarrassing as a player to, you know, be halfway through the split essentially here and still not have your first win. So this is their last shot in that first round robin. Immortals on the other side. You know, since they've made their roster swaps, the desk was actually talking about it, they have looked much better. So they want to try to actually prove, you know, that they are a better team than their record. Uh, they did get their first win after they swapped Nick Smithy. Uh, and the rest of this squad and since then you know they've had some really close games that they failed to execute on we saw those couple moments from insanity in particular who really did have some good games for you know, like 99 percent of it uh, but just kind of had a couple of these big mistakes that cost the team so we'll see if he can keep up his good play early on and kind of uh, i guess curb some of the the mistakes he's been making in the late game yeah, that's always one of the worst feelings in League of Legends. When you're having a really good game, you're the one carrying the team. Everything feels like this is your movie, man. You're the main character. It's time to lead the squad to victory. And you just fumble it right there at the so. one yard line. You just you fumble it. <laughs> but we'll see if he can pull it back together. He has the opportunity here up against Dignitas. As you said, the thing that stands out to me the most here is this is their last shot in that first round robin. This is the last remaining team for Dignitas to not just be defeated by literally everyone else in the LCS. And this is one of the teams that they do have the best chance against. One and seven are Immortals. The desk already said it. 98.5% of their time last week was spent in a super close game state, which means there's tons of playmaking opportunities for their opponents to pull ahead. So who knows? Maybe this is the day of destiny here for Dignitas as Callista, Twisted Fate, Folly Bear, Trundle, Varus, and Ezreal are all banned away and the first pick for Immortals is Karma. Yeah, a little bit strange, but Karma has been kind of rising in priority a fair bit. People are playing more of the Enchanter supports in the bottom lane, and we also have seen you know, a number of double marksman style compositions where you bring something like Graves plus a standard marksman in the bottom lane. Then you have a Karma mid uh, to really kind of rush some of the support items to just power up those marksmen. So. We'll see if that is going to be the choice uh, here from Immortals, but it's pretty versatile. And over on the other side, Ash is something that I really do feel like should be rising in priority. I like the Graves pick here a lot, too. It goes over to kind of denying one of the types of strategies that you would go for alongside that Karma, something I did mention. True. So, you know, it's, it's obviously still possible to go towards Kindred. If you want to play another Marksman jungler, I think you still can go that route, but this could just be support. Um, and we'll see what Ixmithy does want to go towards. Well, 
hovering on this set here for a second, and it looks like mm -hmm. it is a flex. Champion selects. Yep. All right, Mr. Uwu Ears himself locked in for the side of Immortals. They're going to be bringing some, some pain there, some frontline power. And that means I do want to make sure Dignitas is differentiating their damage profile. Just in the show match, we got to look at how Deadman's Plate is such a desirable item on set that <laughs> even when you're up against a full <laughs> AP jungler in top lane, they decided to itemize it. <laughs> I don't know if that's now, a takeaway uh, now, from the show match there, Flower. Oh, are you sure? That, you sure that's not the takeaway? You should itemize Deadman's Plate into double AP? Yeah, well, I mean, well, you know, Silas has chains. Those would be like physical damage, you would think. So thematically, <laughs> it made sense. All right, so if we're going by the lore, it made sense. Yeah. But right now, the two champions that Dignitas has, that dead man's plate is just phenomenal to rush against these guys. Now, going up against the Orn, a lot of times we will see something different. We'll see some Blade of the Ruined King. We'll see some Black Cleaver type of action up against this guy to get some of that tank shredding power in there. And Immortals are going to go ahead and lock in one of those AD carries that we are used to seeing oh so very, very much of. A couple centuries worth, actually. Aphelios picked up here for the Immortals squad. And now we're into the second half of the bands. And Urgot is the band for Dignitas, which is telling me they're thinking that set is 100% going into the jungle. They're banning out the Urgot. They want to make sure the Orn doesn't get counterfeit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Urgot uh, was actually a really good pick for a Orm the other day. He was really doing very well onto it. It was into a Volibear, if I'm recalling correctly, but uh, that's a pick he's willing to bring out. Malphite, another thing that he actually has two games on here. So uh, trying to push him off some of the comfort that he has actually shown. Alorum has been one of the only guys actually playing Malphite. You know, most of the top laners in LCS just stick to Orm. They're not branching out to the Mal guys and the Malphites, which I do think can be very effective. But uh, over on the Immortal side, I wouldn't mind seeing them ban out like, a Mage. Uh, I do think hey, Oriana makes a lot of sense go. because it's magic damage is, is conspicuously absent, right? From the Dignitas side, you you are expecting them to go towards like a Corky or an Azir or you know something that brings high consistent magic damage from the mid lane, um, and you know targeting one of those comfort picks here for Phoenix does make quite a bit of sense. Picking up the Thresh here, I also think seems like a sound decision. You've got Ash. We kind of got to see a little bit during the show match last game of what happens when Ash doesn't have a support that can protect her well. <laughs> and you just kind of got to watch Vladimir and Set go, all right, guys, where's Ash? And it's one of those classic, like, season two League of Legends videos that talks about how the best way to play Zin Zhao is wait until you find enemy Ash and just constantly right click him because he's not <laughs> allowed to play the game if you're in the same game he is. So maybe this Thresh will be able to keep Johnson alive to a degree that Dignitas will be happy with. Now, Apollo picking up the Aatrox there for Alorum in the top side. So that does mean the set is going into the jungle there for Xmithy. And what will the final pick of this draft be? We still could see the mid lane Karma. Okay, this is actually, I still think this is, uh, this is solid. I like the Syndra. Plenty of burst potential on both Graves and Ash. Remember, Graves got the True Grit magic resistance removed a long time ago. So very vulnerable to that burst if she gets the chance to hit him. I like this. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not bad. You know, the Syndra pick is very blindable, as you say. You know, it, it is a strong just kind of overall pick. Um, Immortals, I think, have a lot of really kind of one-two item power. You know, on the early game when you have Syndra on the Spell Pen plus Ludens, you know, you have Set on, on Jungle Item, you know, Aatrox on Black Cleaver. These types of power spikes are going to be really, really effective for them. Uh, they are missing Engage pretty heavily, so that does mean that Immortals generally are going to have more pressure on them to do well in the early game. When you are playing these style of compositions where you can only really engage through flanking. Generally, the way you win the game is you get ahead early, you set up first at the objective, and then you circumvent your lack of engage by forcing your opponents to come and fight you at Dragons, at Rift Heralds, where you don't really need to have that hard engage. On the other side, though, Dignitas, I think, has, has much better scaling. Uh, their team fight engage is great. Obviously, you can fish for hooks and things like that, but the Ash Arrow plus the Orin Ultimate are going to be pretty consistent as far as actually you know finding members uh, from the Immortals squad. So I do think that there's you know, a fair bit of pressure on Immortals to do well early on. And I'm going to go ahead and just go on record right now before the game even starts. I don't like that from Immortals. I think that all too often, teams that seem to be all aboard the struggle bus here in the LCS, teams that are struggling to find wins, the team coordination isn't where it needs to be, they draft themselves into this corner by going, let's play something that the LPL or G2 could pop off with. <laughs> You're not in the LPL. You're not G2. You need engage mechanisms. Now, 
They might be able to prove me wrong. They might be able to say, Captain Flowers, you are dumb, and there is a reason you are not the smart caster. And if they do, <laughs> I will say, all right, boys, fair enough. But, but I have seen this story so many times, Isaac. So many well, times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm with you. And here's the thing. You know, even if it does work, it doesn't always, like, prove uh, that, it, that it was the smartest decision to go for, right? You know, it's fairly common, so it's not like they're doing something super, you know, uh, out there and super weird. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually, you know, in, in agreement with you. I'm not really a fan of these style of compositions. I do think that the win conditions are much more narrow than that of, you know, what uh, their opponents are playing. Dardock is actually going Ignite. Ignite, Smite, Phase Rush. Oh, Baby, Holy it's Chad God. Graves in the jungle, looking <laughs> for the PvP power, making sure that you are never going to contest him 1v1. You are never going to fight him for no scuttle crab. Every single time this man is on your screen, you better be walking away. On the same, at the same time, if he goofs up, the dude is 200% dead, and yeah. everybody is going to flame this summoner spell choice. I wonder if it was an accident. You know, I'm not sure. Um, they are going to see uh, Dignitas going by for the invade. Uh, thankfully for Immortals, they're starting up on the top side, so it can be some of that vertical jungling. Uh, when you do go up against uh, this Ignite style, like, it's really uncommon, let's be honest. Uh, you do see it sometimes from things like Hecarim, Shaco, it's really common. You know, sometimes, every once in a while, you'll see someone try to do it as a bit of a cheese pick uh, or like kind of like a 1v1 style counter. Uh, when yeah. you're doing that alongside Phase Rush, it is going to make your dueling power so good against the set. You know, there's not really much hope that set has in the early stages. Uh, if you do run into the 1v1 with Graves kiting you out and being able to drop the Ignite as well, that can be pretty brutal. And Xmithy is actually not going straight towards the red. Uh, because nope. he's actually seeing his mid lane get pushed in, he doesn't necessarily have that option. So he's just going to straight up be behind a couple camps. He's doing a full clear of his blue side of the jungle. Sure, he can go over to the Raptors, but most of those are gone. The red buff is gone. Uh, so there's not going to be a ton for him to do. And this level one start is already great for Dignitas. And I think the Ignite, like, let's, let's just assume it was intentional and we'll go from there. Uh, makes sense in the context of having multiple pushing lanes. If you think yep. that Azir can just shove out mid constantly, and you have Ash, which is you know pretty strong push on the bottom side, if you think that they're going to be able to push constantly too, then maybe it makes sense. Hey, take this really aggressive summoner choice, constantly invade, look to slam this set, because we talked about how Immortals should have pressure on them to win the game early. And if they are not ahead early, uh, and set is getting pushed behind because of this, then hey, maybe it's going to pay off. And you could see that, as you said, Dardock took most of those Raptors, but not all of them. So Smithy did have to take a little bit of extra time to clear those remaining two away from the rest of the camp. And Dardock now back in his own side of the jungle. His farm isn't super far ahead of Smithy because although he did get the initial camp advantage, his pathing has had to be incredibly inefficient to go from red to red and then skip the rest of the camps and go down to his own blue. His priority on not trading back any of his buffs has rendered him with out a whole lot of great early pathing to keep that lead pumping early. But now he still has plenty of camps left to farm, whereas Xmithy yeah. is waiting on those to respawn. And that's the key, right? That is exactly what it is about. He's actually going to double scuttle him as well. Because oh, again, he's getting they're, too crapped. Yeah, they're, they're constantly shoving in mid. So Insanity's not able to move. It, it really limits Xmithy's options when your mid lane is going to be locked in there. If you try to invade, you'll get stuff taken away. This is actually pretty smart from Xmithy, assuming that the Wolves uh, would still be up. You know, th these players obviously you know are trying to track as much as possible where their opponent's path would be. You know, you're seeing that he's going to be able to sneak something away, but uh, the big deal here is that he double crabs him. He has more camps still to farm, and now he's right on top of Valorum. Valorum face checking that brush takes multiple autos on the first half of the Ooh. end of the line there. So Dardok immediately doing big favors for Lorlo up there in that top lane. As Smithy shows up bottom side, flash into the face breaker, but he's not going to grab the stuns. Aphromu tries to get himself away. Nice hook onto Smithy underneath the turret. The last turret shot won't come out in time. It's both summoners from Afro in exchange for the flash and heal from the side of the board. Yeah, that, that was kind of just, I think, a, a bit of a desperation gank. You know, it wasn't the best setup, but Xmithy knows he, he really has nothing to do. So he, he's got to try to get s someone ahead on his team. He's got to try to create some sort of window of opportunity. And Alorum, they're actually stacking the wave. Oh, because Xmithy showed down there on the bottom side, uh, this is just absolute sadness as a top laner. When you see that wave slow pushing, when your jungler shows other side of the map, you just have to leave. You don't even get to get experience and farm here. So now Xmithy is running straight to top. He can try to get back towards the this turret, but 
Oh, there's a TP, double TP. It's a, it's a 2v2 that's about to become a 3v3. Dardock still has the Ignite, keep it in mind. Dignitas looking to get themselves away. Dardock gonna be under fire. First blood over to Phoenix, and Dignitas have found the first kill of the game. Insanity will try to get himself away. Dardock's walking out with 100 HP, and Dignitas make the play. Nicely done, they're able to make it happen. You know, chunking out Ixmithy and Alorum early and just try to block off uh, that kind of path towards that tower. And meanwhile, the wave was actually good uh, for Dignitas mid lane too. So Alorum trying to move back up, but he's getting zoned off the tower so heavily. Dardock comes over the top, starts getting damage down on Ixmithy. You know, he still has the Ignite, he still has the phase brush. And as Alorum goes in, he's just so low that the Ignite alone, plus a little bit of Sand Soldier damage from Phoenix was enough to get the kill. And now Flash Dardock- going to do that. That's <laughs> true. Flash doesn't do damage. Why are you taking it? <laughs> Bunch of noobs out here taking Flash every game. Everybody should be taking Ignite <laughs> as Phoenix shuffles Insanity right back towards Dardock's waiting arms and a barrel full of death. That is two kills for the Dignitas squad. And now they will march down into this bottom half of the river and Dardock should be able to take himself this first Drake. No contest. And that is just so smart. You know, the reason that they go for that gank, you're like, why Why would a Graves go for a lane gank? It's because the Flash was forced up on the top side. And Sanity tried to chase in to actually finish off Dardock when they had that 3v3 up by the top lane turret. So knowing that the Flash is down on him and that Flash is up for Phoenix, it's essentially a guaranteed uh, knock-in from the Azir. And then Graves just has to be there for a little bit of added damage. And that's going to be a, an easy-peasy kill over on Syndra. And, this early game is just going terrible for Immortals. And Dardock is coming back to the enemy red buff. Wants to make sure that Xmithy never gets to see any of these things throughout the course of the whole game. <laughs> Xmithy's doing a good job at staying caught up in farm, but when you're losing all the important camps, when you're losing all those buffs, it still feels bad. Dardock likely going to need these Krugs here oh, to hit man. that level 6. If Dardock can grab this big Krug and hit level 6 in time for this minion wave to clash, they're going to have a real bad time there. For the yeah, he's bottom six. Lane. Okay, let's see if they can make it happen. Dignitas still only level five for both bottom laners, so there's no arrow, there's no box. Dardock's gonna walk over the control board, doesn't bother to shoot it, just kind of gonna live and let live with that one. And now paths back towards what could be the mid lane. And you can see on the left side of your screen right there, top three in the game. Well, now Apollo went and made me a liar, but for a second there, it was top three in the game in terms of gold value on the side of Dignitas. This squad yeah. up over a thousand gold. Yeah, and Xmithy and Alorum down a couple of sad boys down at the bottom. <laughs> Not having a lot of gold there too. There sad the boy hours in bottom lane. <laughs> just, uh, just pumping little peeps, sitting there in the dark, <laughs> playing some League of Legends. Uh, I don't know about you, man, but anytime I play top lane and I know I'm about to get dove and the wave gets stacked and I get dove, I'm feeling pretty sad. So feeling, uh, feeling a little bit bad for Alorum up there on the top <laughs> side, and especially when you consider you know, you're kind of drafting this this early mid game skirmish comp. Obviously, the game is, is not over by any means. The Dignitas you know, has, has yet to be able to close out a game, so we'll see if they can make things happen with this lead. But the start is fantastic for Dignitas. Now Dardock spotted on this Herald. Remember, he doesn't have flash; he just used dash. Yeah, Lorem just having the right timing there, seeing that Dardock's coming over the wall just as the ward gets placed down. Dardock does get himself back over safely, but now this is pretty much a TY for leash moment for Immortals. They should be able to take this. I mean, Dardock's, Dardock's got no flash. There's no world where he comes back into this Ooh, pit and goes, nope, just slide I there? want the Shelly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that happening, Isaac. <laughs> just quick draw. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'll ignite it! Exactly. No, if only, if, if only you could ignite Shelly, you know, then, then you'd really have the supreme objective control. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that's not the state of the game right now, and Dignitas end up giving the Rift Herald over to their opponents. Maybe Xmithy can drop that for some plates, help get the team back in the game a little bit here in terms of gold. They're still going to have all four minutes of it. They managed to secure that before the 10 minute mark, so that means the entire duration is plate viable. Oh, as Lorlo and Dardock, oh no, Alorum. Here comes the Ornhorn. The damage goes through, the CC comes down. There's no point in even thinking about what would happen if he got away, because the man is dead to rights. Dardock, two kills, one assist, out farming. The Graves is off the start he wants. Yeah, definitely having a good start there. And Dardock and Lorlo, you know, not only have they played together in the past? They played together way back in the day on, on TL. These guys are good friends. They always like to play off of each other, and Dardock has had so much success going towards Lorlo lanes in the past. So 
Nice to see those guys reunited and having some success here in the early game. Aurora put very far behind in, in a matchup that you're not going to really be able to outscale or, by, or anything by no. any means. The Orin is going to have more use in the team fighting, you know, more use with those ornaments. And, you know, it's, it's not a, a champion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Apollo sits some trouble down here at the bottom side. Xmithy drops the Rift Herald, and it's going to walk up and grab some play money. We're seeing more players join the mix. Lorlo shows up just to take a quick lantern ride, as now Shelly's going to get popped before she even makes her way down to the turret. That was a terrible Shelly, use no. of the Rift Herald. What in the hell was the point of that Rift Herald? He just gets summoned up, and then there's nothing. Nothing coming up afterwards. Zoning big Herald. misplay there from, I guess. That was a big misplay there from Immortals. That was a chance to try to come back into the game a little bit, use the Rift Herald, knock down the turret, get some of that bonus gold, but now it's yeah. all denied. Yeah, it's definitely rough. I, th I think t they didn't expect Arduk to be there. We'll see if uh, Aphrom wants to go for the Flash. Okay, let's see if they can find their chance here. Dignitas using the power of the lower low CC, and they've got the kill onto Apollo, taking advantage of that Aphelios' vulnerabilities in the lane before he scales up, before he becomes unstoppable. Shut him down, make the plays nice and early. Dignitas are at a 2,000 gold lead, Isaac. Yeah, and I mean, they forced both the summoners early, because honestly, Apollo was just sieging so aggressively. Uh, he kind of just walked up to the turret and was autoing it while Hakuo was back behind him. So they got the summoners, and then, yeah, Immortals try to drop that Herald, and I just don't think that they were really expecting Jarduk to already be there. Then a good TP comes through, uh, and everything is, is honestly looking pretty bad for Immortals early on here. Dignitas is monstrously ahead. The comp that I think is a lot easier to play out, a lot easier to execute on, uh, and honestly outscales Immortals. So the ball is very much in their court. We'll see what they can do with it. Ocean Rift as well. So not only is this a potential soul stack for the side of Dignitas, it's an ocean soul on a team that has Orn. You're talking about how Alorum's falling behind in this matchup and how Aatrox isn't going to scale up. I can't wait till we get to see a level 13 Orn that has upgraded Abyssal <laughs> Mask and Sunfire Cape stand in the Q3 sweet spot and take 150 damage out of his 3,400 health pool because that's going to be the story of this Orn versus Aatrox matchup and Immortals will have absolutely no answer to this in the side lane. Jungle set? doesn't go for Blade of the Ruin King, Black Cleaver. He's not one of these like 1v1, beat you around, smack you down type of champions. He plays more for the team. You usually see them get like a dead man's plate into a gargoyle stone plate. They're big initiators, they're meatballs. And this is looking rough, man. Yeah, I mean, it's really tough because you, you don't have a, a side lane win condition truly on the side of Immortals. You're probably gonna get out team fought pretty consistently. Uh, you know, there's, there's just not a lot going for them, but they will be looking for picks. They will be, you know, trying to disengage uh, on some of uh, the plays, you know, from Dignitas, try to kite it out, see what you can get done. Obviously, there is still a lot of damage potential between Aphelios and Syndra, and that's what they're going to be pretty reliant on here, but the early game has, has not gone to plan at all for Immortals and Dignitas. You know, honestly, this is uh, the best they've looked, I would say, in, in any of their games so far this split, and Dardock coming out pretty hot. Whoa, Dardock will be pulled back by the Face Breaker, but Phase Rush is more than enough to get him out of there, make sure that Immortals aren't able to finish the job. Phoenix loses the first third of his HP, but Insanity does not have enough power to burst him down, take him out there. Immortals still yet to get on the board here in this game. And as we're about to hit the 14 minute mark, as the turret plates are about to disappear, now I'm looking at what you mentioned earlier, Isaac. Can Dignitas do what they have not been able to do in so many previous games this split and actually keep that momentum going? They need to not only show that they can build these things early on, but that they can stop themselves from then throwing them away in an equally spectacular fashion. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're in a great spot to do it. I mean, I think it, it becomes pretty simple. If they won their early game, they have two dragons. I just want to see Dignitas setting up, you know, at least a minute early. Oh, the hook is going to connect. Over the wall they go. Two versus one. Hakuo the target. This is not a tanky champion. And that is free money for Dignitas. Johnson putting 300 in the pocket. Yeah, nice catch. That's what you, it can happen when you're actually just recalling on a ward like that. You know, pretty lazy recalls from Immortals, and uh, Apollo's did go through, but Alorum now in trouble up here on this top side. Oh, again. no, again, it just keeps happening. Alorum has no way out of this, and Dardok and Lorlo are working together so well here in this top side. They're looking great. They're just absolutely crushing Alorum. He even flashed there, but Lorlo still tagged him with the redirect of the ultimate, got that knockup, and yeah, I just want to see Dignitas set up, 
continue to push towards this soul. You have full control in this game. No reason that they should be losing dragons at this point. You, know, you can have soul in the next 12 minutes or so here, you know, uh, even 10 minutes, and depending on how fast they take them on, on spawn, you know, how quickly they're going to be moving towards that. But definitely they shouldn't be giving up any of those dragons because you, know, you take this next one in a minute 30, and then you're going to force your opponents to come to you, you know, for that potential final fight uh, five minutes thereafter. And, and I really want to see Dignitas continue to look for that. And this is just such a tough situation for Immortals, especially with that Herald now being picked up by the side of Dignitas. This time around, Darduk was not interrupted when he took it. They made sure that they got the Herald off the back and making a play top. So now they can use that Shelly as a distraction somewhere else to guarantee they get that third Drake, make sure they put themselves on Soul Point, and just continue putting the screws to Immortals as we progress through this game and get ever closer to what looks like it should be the first Dignitas win of the split. Commanding a 3,000 gold lead with the scaling power of an Orn and an Azir at 16 minutes? That, that's two thumbs up from me, Isaac. That's exactly what I would like to see on one of my teams when I'm playing League of Legends. Yeah, they are looking great. And here they are trying to deny some of this vision. They haven't fully swept it out, of course, but you know, Dardoch just base. He's coming back. He has two pinks. You can see pinks in a lot of the inventory here of the bot lane, etc. Uh, so they are going to start to try to clear out all this vision together. They are looking to do a really quick uh, dragon take and, and try to get it you know, even much faster than that you know, 10 minutes or so that I was talking about earlier. You know, They obviously could do both on spawn and, and have soul here in like six minutes, which is pretty much GG uh, when you have Ocean Soul plus a front line. It, the opponents just aren't really able to actually punch through the horn at all in that case. And right. they're on it. It is spotted, but I don't even know if Immortals can really do anything. Like, Smithy's not even looking like he's going to be there at times to even try. Arrow fired over the wall just to make sure nobody was going to try to come in there and stop him. And there you go. Three Drakes for Dignitas. The gold lead has shrank down to about 2,000 now. Immortals walking up here. Smithy moving forward, but see what the opportunity could even be for him to find. Smithy is aware that Dardock is over the wall. Maybe if Dardock sticks around on his lonesome as he tries to get himself away with the ulti, but now it's Smithy using the flash to try to bring him back. And when your set flash ulti doesn't result in a kill in a 3v1, that's not it. That's, that's, that's not it. This is definitely looking rough. Dardock just crossed the phase rush and just scoots on out of there. <laughs> even able to drop the ignite. Uh, I do believe he's playing Nimbus Cloak, so Ignite for speed up, you know, relatively short cooldown there. That plus phase rush, he just slides on out of there, no problem. And yeah, that's that's Flash, that's Alt. You are down two levels to this Graves, who is getting ridiculously strong, even with Zerker Graves, which you don't usually see in competitive play. Uh, it's more of like the solo QS style where you're really snowballing and, and want that extra attack speed. And Immortals, like, I know the gold isn't that far behind, but I just feel like the game's over, to be honest it's, with you. It's the, it's the compositions, right? It's yeah. not the fact that the game's 2,500, 3,000 gold apart. It's the fact that you've got Aatrox with no advantage whatsoever over an Orn that is one level away from getting 3,000 gold's worth of free stats. It's the fact that Azir has been able to free farm and is just scaling up as much as he wants. It's the fact that the Graves is just about at Black Cleaver here, and your set hasn't really found the opportunity to get these engages he's looking for. Everything's just coming up Dignitas here in this mid game as they're looking to push down mid lane and secure their second turret of the match. Let's see if they have the power to do it. A couple more auto attacks onto this are going to be required even after the Shelly charge. Arrow comes through. Insanity will be kept safe there. Mikhail's Crucible purchased by Hakuo to get rid of that stun and make sure the Immortals mid laner stays alive. I think that's a really smart buy from Hakuo, but yeah, I mean, it, everything you said, plus the fact that they don't have any side laning or engage to make it even worse, right? So it's just like, uh, there's not a lot of ways you can actually win this game besides just hoping that your opponents mess up repeatedly, like over and over and over pretty much. You know, yeah. this, is, this is not even one of those games where it's like you get one pick and then you win the game. Um, yeah. They are so far behind and are gonna have to be fighting against Soul the whole way through. Uh, so this is, you know, a, a really, really rough one from Immortals. I think that Dignitas deserves a lot of credit for, for how they actually played this one out. 
I think the level one start from Dardock, you know, the invade utilizing this phase rush ignite graves has been really, really good. Phoenix as well as Johnson just constantly pushing in waves, trying to extend that lead for Dardock, allowing him to have the freedom to go wherever he wants to get whatever he wants done. And he has been the recipient of a lot of that help and made it pay off as, you know, he's sitting three, zero and two. He's gonna have his Black Cleaver here very shortly. We'll definitely have it before the next dragon does come up for that soul fight. And I think at that point, we're just gonna see Immortals commit to a fight and uh, pray it goes their way. Unfortunately, I think Immortals are about four items on Aphelios away from being able to win a team fight. Looking at this game, I'm, I'm not even just trying to be cheeky or sassy in saying this. Looking at where the gold is, looking at how far ahead Dignitas are in this match, I think six item Aphelios pulling off some crazy 200 years team fight is the Immortals win condition. Yeah. O and other than that, I don't see where it comes from. I actually don't, like, I still think that they, they probably would just lose. If you're talking six items versus six items, I still think that they don't really have much of a chance, you know, unless it's a, a really big misplay from, from their opponents, like they're all five stacks in an inf Infernum Ultimate or something. Um, because, you know, one of, the, one of the things with Aphelios is that your, your range is fairly low, and it can be difficult to actually fight into champions like Azir, uh, who can actually create these zones of, you know, these zones of control with the Sand Soldiers, because he has so much more range than you, and you're always going to be you know, at threat of getting flash flayed or or shuffled in and things like that. So uh, it's it's actually really difficult, I think, to, to play this one now uh, for Aphelios. But we'll see if Immortals can get anything done. Next dragon, 40 seconds, and that's where Dignitas is looking for Soul, which pretty much would close out this game. Immortals has a chance, maybe if they can find you know a pick with Insanity, you know, hit someone with Scatter of the Week, burst someone down to start the fight. Then you're starting to see some opportunity. And honestly, Immortals feel a little bit more comfortable pushing into this bottom side river than they otherwise would because Johnson just split the uprights there with the arrow, wasn't able to find a mark with that one, so they know that the arrow's not around to set up one of those picks for the side of Dignitas. So Immortals, though, then immediately have to re-yield that position because once everybody shows up from the side of Dignitas, they know that a 5v5 does not favor them. There's that Ocean Drake landing in the pit, spawning up, and as soon as it is available, it is now aggro. Dignitas looking to go for this Ocean Soul, daring Immortals to come stop them, and Lorem getting himself grabbed by the Death Sentence, has to flash away, and now the fight's gonna be breaking out. Damage coming through, Dardog going down. Ladies and gentlemen, Immortals have found a pick. They have found a way into the fight. They go for it and are rewarded, but can Dignitas find their counterattack now? Ornhorn able to find the knockup onto the IMT top laner. A nice death sentence coming down onto Xmithy, but that's going to be cleansed away by the Mikhails. Immortals now trying to find a little bit more damage. Johnson will barely walk away from this one. Phoenix without a lot of mana to work with, but is trying to command that range that Azale was talking about earlier. Dignitas do not want to fully relinquish control over this area. Aphromu and Phoenix sticking around. Johnson has TP. He's looking to rejoin. Remember, with Dardock being the one dead, Dignitas has no smite secure. They have no objective control through summoner spells here. Alorum over the wall forced to dash back out. Immortals. The same as Dignitas, not willing to concede this territory. <laughs> Neither side will walk away from Here's this the one. problem. Insanity never got to base and TP back, so he's actually still low. Lorlo and Johnson refilled their jungler is here first, so looking like it's just going to be Dignitas' soul. There it is. Secured by Johnson as you're seeing Lorlo zone everybody from Immortals GG. away, but they're being zoned right into the Shadow Realm now, ladies and gentlemen. There's the soul, there's three kills, there's the victory march towards the Baron Pit from Dignitas. That is all she wrote. Sign on the dotted line and put this one away. Yeah, this one is uh, very, very over at this point. Immortals honestly just basically put up no fight this game whatsoever. It felt like their draft was was really, really off to me. Uh, they left themselves very few win conditions. Dignitas closed the door on those within the first couple minutes of the game, it felt like. And uh, this one is honestly a slaughter, which is a shock to see that it is our winless team who is actually slamming Immortals after a lot of people were actually pretty, pretty hot on Immortals, you know, all things considered, you know, feeling like at the very least, they were they were significantly better than their record did show. You know, this roster swapped in. They actually, you know, took a win immediately. Then they lost to Cloud9, but they were competitive against, you know, TL. They were competitive against, I want to say it was like EG2. So uh, they have had some, some very close games. And to go from that to playing against this team that everyone's kind of looking at as the, the gimme game uh, is getting flipped completely on its head. And that's one of the things that I think 
deserves criticism a lot, particularly of middle of the pack LCS teams usually, is consistency. It doesn't matter if you can take games off of the top teams and stay close with 16 them. 16 versus 12, by the way. Oh my goodness, it is actually a four level difference as Alorum is winning out in this battle here at the start. <laughs> he, will, he will get away, but uh, now the rest of Dignitas has showed up. And no, the point I was making as they're just gonna bulldoze all these structures down, does it really matter if you can stay competitive with some of the better teams if at the same time you can lose 10 to one against the worst team in the league? There's some serious consistency issues there that these teams have to be able to address because as you're talking about, it just seems kind of crazy that this is the reality that we're in after the week that Immortals had last time with those closed games. As the Orn Horn sounds off, the turret goes down, the death sentence comes out, Insanity gets away. Now the counterattack's coming through. Dardock barely getting himself back. Phoenix goes on a killing spree. Afromu also just limping away from the fight, but nobody on Dignitas is down. What is that, ladies and gentlemen? That's right, it's an ocean soul, and those health bars are just gonna continue to climb back up slowly but surely. Immortals will try to hold the line, but the death sentences do not stop. Aphromu is dialing these in today, and there you go. Phoenix able to throw that enemy AD carry right back to the rest of his team. Insanity will try to escape from Lorlo. He'll stay alive, but now he is separated from the remaining Nexus turret and his remaining two teammates. Dignitas trying to stick around and in this one right here. Dardock making sure to interrupt the back, giving the Teemo thumbs up. See you later, bro, as Dignitas are on to the Nexus now. x will try to hold the line with the Haymaker shield, but he will not hold for long. Insanity is taken down by the end of the line, and it is just that for Immortals. It took nine games, but Dignitas will finally secure their first win of the Summer Split. And a really good game, to be honest, from them. All credit to them. Yes, I think Immortals made mistakes. Yes, I think Immortals did kind of mess up in draft. But Dignitas capitalized on every single mistake uh, that Immortals did make. I think their level one, you know, their early game planning, the Graves of the Ignite actually worked out so damn well here from Dardock. He played great, uh, you know, really paired up well with Lorlo. And and I've got to give credit where credit's due, not only to Dardock, but also to Phoenix, because I was very critical of Phoenix after his TF game last week. I think that was a really really, really poor performance from a guy who has been around in the league for such a long time, and I think he was a, a huge part of, of why they actually won here today. He didn't really make any mistakes. Uh, both the roster swaps that actually did happen from Digtoss were Dardock and Phoenix, and if these guys can play at that level, uh, then we can see, I think, a, a lot better things coming from Dignitas going forward. Yeah, it's all about that consistency that I was talking about, though. This team needs to make sure that they're staying along this path. They need to continue with this proactive early game, having a set strategy, and then making sure that they're not making those mistakes that we have rightfully criticized them for in the past. Once it gets to the mid game, once it gets to the late game, Dignitas have shown now they know how to win some League of Legends. So let's see them keep it up moving forward into the second round, Robin, and second half of this split. But we're going to go ahead and take a break right now. Catch us back here afterwards where Riv is going to meet up with a Verizon post-game interview to hear from Dardock about the much-needed Dignitas win. Don't go anywhere. You playing Smite on Skarner now or Ignite? <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Verizon Post Game Interview. I'm Riv, and I am joined by Dignitas's Dardock after their victory over Immortals, putting a win on the scoreboard. I just got to say, overall, man, it's been a while. How are you? How have you been? I'm doing all right, all things considered. I mean, our standings aren't in the best spot, but at least atmosphere and you know how we're feeling in general is on the ups and up, on the up and up. That's great to hear. Uh, seeing this one come in, what are your your thoughts on today's game? It was clean, and this is the perfect time to do it as we come up to the halfway point of the split. Um, I mean, in general, it was pretty clean. We had some mistakes. I mean, my mistake on Harold was pretty bad, giving them Harold after our initial lead. But other than that, I think our macro was pretty good. Awesome. Did you? So we got to talk about the Graves coming into today. Was there a reason you picked it, or are you just coming in saying this is Ignite Graves Phase Rush Nimbus Cloak? We're we're lacing up. Um, honestly, we kind of had a really good preparation, so I was mentally prepared to play Graves if it was like a good draft scenario for it. And after they first pick Karma, it looks pretty good, so just had to roll with it. And when we first came in and we were just kind of chatting before the interview, you said that a lot of your games were going this way in scrims and whatnot. Uh, what do you think the disconnect was at the beginning of the split that puts Dignitas where they are right now? Um, well, I can't speak for, you know, the other roster, obviously, but at least as far as our results go for the last two weeks, I think, or for the last week, rather, I think we just, or, you know, we're a generally pretty inconsistent team, so... That's just a product of us not having much practice together yet. But I think our goal should just be to show better performances every week. And, you know, it is top A for playoffs this year. So it's not going to be, you know, out of our grasp. Right. Now, I mean, it looks like things are going well so far. Hopefully the games can keep going this way. A few more questions for you. Who who are you currently watching uh, right now to up your game, be better? Who Who's on uh, the front of your screen when you're just downtime and training? Um, my favorite player right now around the world to watch is Kanavi. I think he's by far the most, uh, mechanically sound, aggressive jungler around the world right now. So he's been my favorite since the beginning of summer so far. Um, mm -hmm. other than that, I watch a ton of LPL in general. That's like my favorite region to watch. It's definitely my style of gameplay. Um, 
I try awesome. to fit in some LTK <laughs> in there as well. Very cool. Very cool. And final question for you, Dardock. Who takes it tomorrow, Cloud9 or TSN? <laughs> Cloud9. <laughs> It's not very close. <laughs> well, all right, Dardock. Thank you so much for joining me. Congrats on the win, man. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. We're going to take a moment now and throw it back to the State Farm Analyst Desk so they can break that one down. Thank you so much, Rivington. What a great opportunity to hear some words from Dardock because let's face it, he was very influential in the win that Dignitas just received, their first win of the entire split. Hugely influential. When it comes to objective control, we always pin the responsibility, or at least teams love to make the jungler be the one that is asserting in themselves I was hey you got to be here on time we got to go for these plays and despite IMT being pretty bad this game I think they, they played pretty terribly Dignitas just crushed it when it came to punishing them so knowing that you could rotate to the top side and had Phoenix basing for the teleport was a great play again knowing that the Syndra doesn't have flash here being able to then flash over and put her behind it's the ultimate to make sure that Grayson continue to get kills you really saw that the synergy between Darduck and Lord was just abusing Xmithy, Alorum, and Insanity. So uh, this is a super promising game from one of the teams that gave Cloud9 one of the better runs for their money. I, yeah. I, you go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, I, I was just gonna say a big thing that stood out to me for Dardock this game is like he he doesn't have easy to gank lanes. Like they don't have much setup. Like Ash Thresh in the bot lane has really good setup for sure, but. Honestly, the Aatrox Orm matchup is pretty difficult to deal with in terms of ganks because Aatrox is pretty slippery. He has like healing, Orm doesn't have a lot of damage. And then the Azir Syndra matchup, like we noticed, yeah, they were able to punish the Syndra no flash, which is really, really good um, to abuse that timing. But these definitely weren't, you know, just walk up, the laner stuns, and then Dardock has a kill. Like he kind of had to work for it. And it starts from the level one. Like, this is one of those games where it felt like the team had a very coordinated vision of what they were trying to do, which is always cool to see for one of the junglers. It's like, I need this, I need that. I want I want to go in and get his red buff, and then I'll go to my red buff, and we'll three buff him. And then, uh, you know, from there, they, they he set the team back up. He went to each lane, revisited all of them. Even in the bot lane, they had one of those lantern ganks over the wall. Um, so it was, it was really a team effort, and you saw that in the damage graph. You know, pretty much everyone was, was contributing a fair amount to that win. It was keyed off of Dardock, but I think everyone on the team played well. Yeah, great to see some decisive decision making coming out of the jungler and even going into the split Dardock had mentioned he was excited to play with Lorla once again. Obviously a lot of synergy happening there, but on the opposite side, Crumbs, it felt like because of that early game pressure that Dignitas was applying, there wasn't much that Xmithy in the side of Immortals could do to respond to it. Yeah, I did not like what I saw out of Immortals. I was hyped for them because of the closeness of the last four games. They were doing so well, but then th this just did Boom. not look like that team at all. They were what, that force gank from Xmithy in the bottom lane. The way that he got manhandled around the crabs was really just so uncharacteristic from those last few games. And then when they started just in dying in the top lane continually, when you have a Karma failure's bottom lane, you know that game's falling apart. So they need to just prepare a little bit better because it was clear that Dignitas was by far the more prepared team here. And I'm sure Dignitas are ecstatic to get the first win under their belts and Immortals will continue to strive for improvement throughout the rest of the time. But meanwhile, before we go to a break, everyone, MasterCard is collaborating with the LCS to award lucky fans with a couple personalized experiences. One winner will get to play and learn with Freak from the comfort of their own home. And five other participants get a Q&A session with Dash himself. All you have to do is use and save your MasterCard in the League Client contest runs until July 19th and for more information check out the full article on lolesports.com on the other side of the break we have 100 thieves versus flyquest many of us are working from home and adjusting to new co-workers co-workers who borrow supplies and always interrupt meetings a gift can help and when you use your mastercard you have security benefits that keep you protected, so your purchase ends up in the right hands. More mouth. And your staff can start something priceless.